Hi, everyone. I'm going to wait for a bit of baby to hop on. Hello, everyone. My name is Sophie. Good evening, and thank you for tuning in. We here at Books and Books, an independently owned bookstore in Miami, Florida, and in partnership with Miami Book Fair, are so delighted to welcome you to a virtual evening with Tang Wei Hu and Kate Crawford to discuss the new book, Digital Lethargy, Dispatches from the Age of Disconnection, published by our friends at the MIT Press. Um, a bit about the author, Tang Wei Hu is an associate professor of English at the University of Michigan, a former network engineer and a published poet. He is the author of A Prehistory of the Cloud, praised by the New Yorker as mesmerizing and by the Guardian as witty, sharp, and theoretically aware. He was awarded the Rome Prize in Literature in 2022. To moderate this evening's conversation, Professor Kate Crawford is a leading scholar of the social implications of AI. She's a research professor at USC Annenberg, a senior principal researcher at Microsoft Research, and the inaugural chair of AI and Justice at the Ecole Normale Supérieure. Uh, she has advised policymakers in the United Nations, the White House, and the European Parliament, and she currently leads the Knowing Machines Project, an international research collaboration that investigates the foundations of machine learning. Just a quick reminder that throughout this evening's broadcast, you can post any questions you have below in the ask question feature at the bottom of the screen. We will be answering them at the end. And please order your copy of Digital Lethargy from Books and Books and support independent bookstores. Now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Hi. Hi, great to see you, Tonghui. And I want to start by, by saying the deepest congratulations on this wonderful new book, Digital Lethargy. Um, I'm delighted that we get some time today to discuss your work. I've been, so saying, a big fan um, of your writing ever since you published The Prehistory of the Cloud back in 2015. And The Prehistory was just such a powerful account of the violent and extractive legacies that we now metaphorically call the cloud, this soft, fluffy thing that is supposedly around us and with us at all times. And I think in that book, you just so clearly show how it's this infrastructure that grew out of these older military and, and commercial systems of the Cold War through to you know sewer lines and underground cables. And you know, this this moment of of seeing clearly how the cloud consumes so much energy and power and how it depletes our planet and at the same time it sort of replaces public spaces with private ownership. Um, that sort of really produces this sense of, of I think, just relentless loss in, in reading the book. So in this, in this new book, I, I feel like you've written this extraordinary, fascinating companion uh, in the way that it really picks off from, from where you, you left off the last book. And I think if we accept, as I certainly do, that the cloud has captured our attention and as well as our limited planetary resources, you know, then how do we feel about that? What is our emotional reaction to living under digital capitalism? And you've just mapped out with such nuance the kinds of ambivalence and effective disconnection that we can experience when we're trapped inside these digital systems of surveillance and algorithmic control. So I have the pleasure to ask you a few questions uh, over the next half an hour or so, and then we can move to audience Q&A, and I recommend to everybody to add your questions into the chat as we are discussing today. So welcome. Um, it's just a pleasure to have this time together. Um, okay. I'm gonna, Thank you I'm so gonna, much for doing this. Yeah. Oh, it's honestly, it's the, the, the honor is all mine. Um, I want to start with how I experienced reading your book. So for me, it was just how well you capture this experience of being stuck inside a sort of maze of digital systems with no clear way out. So our response might be that we lol or we send a string of death skull emojis or perhaps for me the ultimate expression of digital lethargy is the shruggy. Uh, I don't know. So I want to hear from you how you personally came to the project of this book and why 
you see lethargy as sort of quintessential to the digital condition? You know, lethargy is an interesting word because I tried so hard to name what I was doing. I, and then this book is in some sense a response to how do I call the thing that I'm feeling now? I mean, what is the emoji that I'm using right now? Uh, right now I'm using a old fashioned ASCII one with a colon and a pipe, you know, the, the sort of like blank face. Um, but it's it's true that um, I, I don't know how I'm feeling. And I, I feel like what, what it looks like to me is, is all these things at once. It's doom scrolling, it's, uh, you know, feeling depressed, but it's also feeling overactive, um, feeling like I can't disconnect uh, even as I want to disconnect. Um, you know, the, the book started off uh, uh, from a slightly different um, angle, which is that when I wrote a, the book, uh, Prehistory of the Cloud, um, a bunch of people asked, uh, especially artists, would come to me and say, what should we do? You know, what's our response? Like, should we try to hack Google? Should we, um, you know, make artworks that, you know, uh, you know do some sort of sabotage? Um, and it, it got me thinking that we don't really spend enough time thinking about what the word doing is, um, be even before we get to that answer. Uh, and uh, because doing is something that is so uh, complex right now, we, we have no choice but to do all the time. Right? We have no choice but to to click, or even when we don't click, and uh, that's that's you know in its own way uh, a form of data for the algorithms that has measure what our choices are. So um, I wanted to take a step back from that question and, and say, even before we can be political, what does it mean? Um, you know, who uh, is is who has the privilege to be idle, who has the privilege to be uh, to refuse these systems, uh, who is stuck within it, and um, what is it like to live and feel and attempt to survive uh, within digital capitalism. So it's a, it's a, um, it's a long answer, and, and I'm not sure that uh, I was quite prepared for something like the um, pandemic and its resulting Zoom fatigue to kind of happen in the middle of writing the book, which, you know, was its own, uh, you know, addition to uh, the delaying its, its publication by a few years probably. Um, but uh, yeah, just just trying to, um, I think the hardest thing is, is trying to give language to try to describe um, what seems to be happening now, uh, even when we're not quite sure what it is. Um, and uh, I think that was the reason why I spent so much time looking at works of literature, looking at uh, works of art, looking at performances, to just try to understand how, how people are, are wrestling with maybe the same question of how to name this thing that we're feeling. Mm. I'm so glad you've, you've brought us directly to this, this question of artists and choreographers and filmmakers who really are sort of the, the focal points, the, the lenses through which these feelings are projected. Uh, tell me a little bit about how you see them exploring these feeling states and, and why did you choose these artists and storytellers in particular? Yeah, um, I mean, part of it is because I came across them and there was always something that bugged me about the, the artworks, uh, that there was something that felt like um, people didn't like them for the right way. Uh, you know, that one of the films that I read about Sleeping Beauty, most of the critics say this is kind of like a, a it's not feminist enough, right? There's a, you know, the, the uh, main character of the film should be fighting back against, you know, all the systems of patriarchy and misogyny that, that, um, that oppress her, and, and she's not doing that. Um, she's passive instead. Uh, so most of the artworks that I'm looking at are reticent in some sense. They're not sort of declaring, um, it, they, they seem to fall outside of, of our normal language for, for you know, how we understand them to be working. And because I didn't really understand how they were working, um, uh, I kept coming back to them. There was something kind of disturbing about them. Uh, one example was an uh, artwork by uh, Yoshua Okon um, about, uh, he goes to the um, uh, border and he uh, hires former workers in the maculadora to reproduce a maculadora for him, but except this time, uh, they're making um, cans of laughter. Um, and uh, the sight of, of, you know, uh, brown workers, you know, canning their laughter and exporting it to presumably the U.S. Um, is something really kind of weird and disturbing. And, and also uh, there's some, some quality of it that feels like it's a one-liner. Uh, I remember uh, one critic says, you know, okay, we all understand this, like what this is doing. Uh, it's making fun of capitalism or something. Um, and I think there's something about all the artworks that just seem like they, they, they seem like they're one-liners or they seem like they're not doing enough. Um, but what they're really doing is they're they're trying to map out a different way of, of how we understand all these, these you know, um, both our ambivalence towards these, these very complicated systems that we're caught in um, and also um, a different way of, of 
of being within them. Uh, so uh, that same artwork that I just mentioned, um, uh, it is a course about exploitation, but it's also uh, in some moments in the, in the artwork itself, the workers are kind of laughing at how, how ridiculous the situation is in the first place. Um, it, it, and I, to me, they're doing the equivalent of an LOL, right? There's, uh, there's something going on here that um, in its flatness, in its inability to like please the critics is actually more interesting to me than ones where I'm like, check, I know that this is being like a good artwork that is like taking a stand. Uh, so that's why I wanted to spend a lot of time with these artworks. That's really interesting because in so many ways I see this sort of tradition of, of works that are reticent, of works that almost make you sit with boredom. I and mean, we could think about, you know, Jean Dielman and the sort of, you know, classic French New Wave moments in cinema of just watching someone do very little, just like, you know, housework around the house, you know, extended periods of of not much. And, and to the way in which, of course, now in films like Sleeping Beauty, it's like, it's so unusual to see people doing very little. It seems to be almost the kind of opposite of what this moment of late stage capitalism is asking of us, which is constant motion. So it's strange in, in, in a way that in, in this book, you've used these as texts almost, not in a kind of obvious form of resistance to kind of constant activity, but almost like a different way of being. Right. And, it's, it's something that you write about. There's this fantastic sentence where you say, most of life under digital capitalism feels unrealized, endless, unresponsive, at an impasse, and dead, unquote. And then you, you go on to cite this wonderful lyric from the musician and artist Sun Ra, who wrote, it's after the end of the world. Don't you know that yet? So I want to ask you about how, what is it like to be living after the end? You know, how are digital networks giving us a type of dull afterlife, if you will? Right. Yeah, that's a great description of it, dull afterlife, isn't it? Um, I mean, I think there's that sense uh, with technology that, you know, the, the future is always about to come, right? That uh, if only we get the internet right, if only we decentralize it more, if only we, you know, um, get the right protocols and the right apps, then we'll have, uh, you know, the better, more authentic version of it. Um, and I think that what we lose in that framing of always sort of pushing it off into the future is, um, you know, what about the now? Uh, what about, you know, when this is, what about when the devastation has already happened? Um, you know, we, we spend a lot of time talking about how surveillance has gotten suddenly worse um, because, you know, um, digital tools, data valence and so on. Um, but what about uh, people who have been surveilled for hundreds of years who have been um, marked? Uh, I mean, this is not new news for them, right? It's only news because suddenly, uh, for lack of a better word, you know, the white liberal class is suddenly concerned about its privacy, right? Uh, that someone's watching their porn habits. Um, but uh, for much of the world, um, they haven't had privacy, uh, at least in that sense. Um, so uh, what does it mean to shift our time um, you know, dramatically from a sense of like, how do we talk about the next iteration of technology? How do we talk about the future that's going to come in five years when AI, you know, reaches the single area we have self-driving cars or something to, um, what if, you know, all the problems of AI and technology have already been there? Um, and what do we do uh, that's different from, you know, pushing off the solution um, that, you know, say, oh, hold on, just just wait a little bit more. We promise that, you know, we'll get this right. Uh, we promise that, you know, the next round of technology will not, um, you know, uh, try to track you. Um, you know, what do you, what do we say to migrant populations who are being beta testers um, for, uh, you know, their accent for uh, to try to recognize like where they, they really are from or, or for their faces that are extracted and used. Um, and, those are, you know, Mbembe, Akio Mbembe says, um, you know, the, the end of the world has already happened, right? Sun Ra says, you know, I mean, this is, this is um, a different perspective. And I think to approach um, a kind of time that is, that is endless, um, that does feel like you're stuck in an impasse, um, uh, is, is I think itself a, a move to, to say, you know, hold on, like, let's, let's forget about the shiny optics that kind of distract us away from the, the real structural inequalities that have been there for hundreds of years, that, that you know, the, the um, racial inequalities, the uh, ways in which uh, persons have been objectified, that's what we should be focused on and not, um, you know, the, you know, the, the next way that we're going to uh, make, you know, uh, cameras more inclusive or something. So um, I think that's the, that was the goal of, of that, uh, that kind of polemic 
Slavic statement there. And it's so true because in this way, the end of the world just keeps happening. And the real question is, you know, for whom is the world ending right now? And again and again, we see that it's a question of privilege, who is able to kind of keep their head above water in a time when, you know, the deluge is everywhere. So I, I want to turn us to the topics that really connect to these questions around privilege and class particularly in chapters one and three, which are delightfully called Start When It's Too Late and Laugh Out Loud, um, both of which I think feel like the exact sort of the quintessential experiences of like the last two years. Um, the titles of, of all of the chapters in this book just are, just are so spot on. But you, you write in these chapters about the experience of crowd workers on platforms such as Mechanical Turk, where people are doing digital tasks, you know, for pennies on the hour, be it, you know, labeling pieces of data to train large scale AI, or in some cases, literally impersonating an AI system. Um, these, these kinds of forms of labor are, I think themselves, uh, ways of talking about what is the experience of, of building the network as well as living within it. So I, I'd love to hear from you. If there is a class politics to digital lethargy, is it something really that privileged white collar workers feel, but is actually quite different if, say, for example, you're an Amazon picker who's working on the factory floor trying to sort of keep up with the algorithmic rate? Yeah. yeah um, uh, first, I'll say that the titles were my uh, attempt to get this book accidentally sold as a self-help book. Uh, so it's like kind of a seven-step plan on, on how you should, you know, behave. You should start when it's too late. You should, uh, um, you should go go to sleep and, and so on. Um, uh, to to return the question on labor, which really is at the heart of this book, right? And really is an attempt to tell a story of computation from the perspective of the of the servers that are uh, that seem to that make the network work, that make AI work, and and often are confused for computers, um, but uh, you know are imitating AI or are really doing the the, the um, uh, you know being called by an application programming interface. To, they look like computational code in a lot of cases. Um, uh, they're the human computers that, that power everything. Uh, what I'm trying to do, I think, there is to say, I think there is a kind of um, solidarity that is possible when you realize where you are in the digital supply chain. Um, when you realize that, and, and I say this not just to um, the, the micro workers, to the laborers, to the Amazon workers, that really this book is uh, meant for, but also for you know, people who are white collar workers suffering from Zoom fatigue or something. Um, I think there's a similar problem. And the problem is that we are told uh, constantly that the best thing in the in the world right now is to be more human, to be more personal, uh, to have things be both more personalized, but also for you to have more personhood. And it sets up this kind of impossible um, bar uh, that uh, I think that even white collar workers are very much feeling this, this need to be online, to be your own personal brand, to constantly perform being yourself um, is not a dissimilar problem to uh, the workers who are seen as um, just not quite uh, human enough, right? And that's why they have to be cloaked and wrapped in uh, API interfaces um, so that they can be um, disguised. Uh, uh, you know, people who are doing customer service essentially for the internet, um, people uh, who um, are are seen as robotic, right? As seen as having some sort of defect in personhood. Um, maybe they're, uh, you know, people are worried about exposing their identities because uh, you would realize that they're uh, outsourced. So um, there's some sense that um, they, it's better, it's cleaner somehow to, to call them AIs, to call them robots than to like allow them to be, you know, uh, where, they're, where they are, which is primarily uh, workers of color in the global south. Um, so uh, what I'm trying to do here is to say, um, there's a connection between all these different forms of work on the internet. Uh, uh, the real problem here is, is that we're constantly asked to be ourselves, to constantly be alive, to constantly say, um, this form, this strange form of humanness, where we make choices, where we uh, command other people, we tell other people what to do, where we have, um, uh, you know, where where I am the main character in my own drama, um, is is really a toxic one, and that's that's the thing that both makes uh, white collar workers fatigued um, uh, by being online and, and being themselves all the time, but also connects them to um, other workers uh, who are trying so hard to produce that experience of liveness and humanness. Um, 
for for their clients, uh, even as they uh, are barred from uh, access to that themselves. And so um, hopefully there's some sense that uh, if you see the whole supply chain uh, in a way that, you know, I, I hope uh, is inspired in some ways by uh, Atlas of AI, you know, seeing all these different ways of, um, uh, of, of how, you know, labor in China is all about, um, you know, producing electronics out of the quote, minimal fingers of, of Asian women, right? Uh, mm. You know, you send something to the Philippines because supposedly they have an eye for detail and they're really good at, you know, uh, their war. I mean, all these like, you know, quite racist, you know, ideas of like what, how to extract a, a form of labor from each part of, of the world um, and connect it into uh, this feeling of, of, uh, of being human and being live and being interactive. Exactly. And I, I think about the, the platforms of performance where this idea of always being maximally oneself and, and building that as a type of brand that requires constant maintenance as exhaustion, as a type of just, you know, grinding down that sort of sense of, you know, performing the authentic self. And yeah. I can't help but sort of to want to ask you about this moment that we're seeing playing out this very week um, with Elon Musk taking over the reins of Twitter as the role of chief twit and watching him as he fires the trust and safety team and, and watching him as he fires supposedly up to 75% of his workforce while also planning to pull away, you know, the, the few protections that we have from forms of digital harassment and abuse on these platforms. And what I'm seeing at the moment, of course, is this moment where some people are leaving, people are trying to find somewhere to go, but there's this kind of listless, you know, the party's over, but nobody knows where, like, <laughs> to go next. And and it's it's interesting because of course one of the feelings that that I can see in these spaces is a sense of of being lost, but also a sense of grief, of, of losing a place that felt, even though it was Airsat's community, had mm -hmm. some sense of, of connection. Tell me a little bit how you understand this through the kind of affective lens of this book. Where where do the, where do we see this scene playing out? Yeah, I mean, I think that what's interesting about our ambivalence towards something like Twitter is that, you know, our nostalgia for it uh, is deeply felt. It's not, uh, in, and I think that there's a kind of um, purity that I see in a lot of other books and saying, um, you know, delete your Uber, delete your, uh, you know, delete your Facebook app. Um, that, that doesn't account for, you know, that kind of ambivalent push and pull. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I think about with affect is that affect is sticky, right? And it's social, uh, you know, I get this from Mel Gregg in, in some ways and, and her idea of data sweat. Um, but affect is, is something that uh, is also in the air. And um, what I like about affect is that it is something that connects us with other people um, even if it is through our disappointment with the platform um, there's something kind of palpable about it right now and we're sort of seeing it and so i mean sometimes i'm asked you know what does lethargy do what does an affect do what does a feeling do um, and even though you can't like operationalize it right that you can't sort of convert it into something else um, what we are seeing is uh, the sense that the, the the world that we're in is is not quite right, that there's something broken about it. Um, and what the solution is, whether it's to move to Mastodon or another social network, um, whether it's to kind of linger on um, after the party is still over. Uh, I mean, I, I love that phrase because one of the books that I was thinking of um, is, a, uh, is a, a queer of color uh, critique that says like, you know, what do we do after the party? Like, you know, in the middle, you know, at 4 a.m., uh, now that the party's over, we're sort of wandering the streets by ourselves. Like, how do we find company still? Um, and I think it's possible to find company even in dispossession, even in that feeling that uh, that is often flattening. Um, that lethargy is itself a kind of lively, um, it's lively and flattened at the same time. Pessimism is dynamic, even as it sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, makes us feel uh, um, uh, crushed by it. Uh, there, and so I think, you know, maybe I'm being a little bit too optimistic here, but I think the the after the partiness, the the lethargy, the, the way that we're kind of sorting through our own feelings towards the platform, towards each other on it, um, as it's muted by the platform, 
is a really interesting and valuable moment, right? That um, in some ways should have happened earlier, you know, because I think that would have produced, um, yeah. I mean, it's hard again to like draw a line and say, and this will make us all, you know, um, I mean, I think we all realized that Elon you know, Musk was a, was a twit a long time ago, but, um, uh, you know, I'm not sure what we should do about it yet, but it's a really interesting sorting through. And I wish that we, we could have that kind of same sense of detachment and, um, and pastness, right? Like, you know, putting this, the thing has already happened. You know, how do we, how do we talk about the internet if something has already happened? Um, how do we, you know, talk about um, all these things as, as things that, you know, um, are not the, the final stage in the development of technology, but are something that, um, that, that for this like strange phenomenon that we did for like five years or 10 years. Um, and, and that will help us design what the next thing is. Mm. I want to return you to something you just said in relation to this idea that affects are difficult to operationalize, to monetize. And yet, of course, one of the sort of big movements at the moment from digital capitalism is indeed to extract value precisely from what's called affect detection, which is to use a series of algorithms that are tracking the micro expressions as they're referred to in our faces to make predictions as to our inner states, whether we feel happy or sad or surprised or shocked or, you know, interestingly, the sorts of paradigms of emotion that are commonly seen in, in AI emotion tracking that tends to be generally between six to eight, which take us back to sort of the early ideas of six universal emotions from Paul Ekman, who I've sort of critiqued at length in other work. But what's interesting to me is that is that the types of affect that you write about here in digital lethargy are not in that list. Like there's no, there's no apathy, there's no lethargy, there's no indecision, there's no shruggy. You know, that that isn't a monetizable affect. So I, I'd love to hear from you, you know, while we are in this moment where affects are literally the frontier of capital extraction, are you suggesting that there are this sort of there's almost an escape through sort of feeling these things that are that are outside of being able to sell ads to us for? Yeah, I mean, I, I love um, your writing on affective AI because I, I think of actually this book that my um, uh, we bought from my toddler to teach him how to recognize emotions, and they're all actors. They're going like <laughs> for surprise, right? It's ridiculous. Like this is not how. I mean, occasions happens, but uh, you know, most of the time, you know, our emotions are much more complex, and you, you really can't tell. Even I look at that book, I'm like, is that is that astonishment or is that embarrassment? Like, it's it's hard to. You know, maybe I have some sort of facial you know, recognition problems of my own, but um, it's kind of ridiculous, right, to think that you can extract some sort of universal emotion out of these, um, and and it gets operationalized, uh, you know, uh, through emoticon detection programs, the sentiment analysis that scrape, you know, uh, tweets to see, you know, oh, okay, is this person. Um, I remember uh, my partner was thinking about working for um, the Department of Defense because they had this idea that you could um, sense the emotions of a country and maybe like figure out whether or not they could you know be in revolt or you know um, that they could you know uh, you could you could sense yeah I mean again uh, by scraping language and, and turning into them. so all of these things are, are a little bit ridiculous um, but I think that what's interesting about lethargy is that it is an unstable affect it doesn't um, resolve itself into uh, something into like one or two emotions um, it's it's kind of all of the above at the same time and sometimes the way that it manifests itself um, uh, may very well be you know anger or astonishment and sometimes it may be boredom and some combination of them so I, I love you know the idea of exploring an emotional terrain that is not quite um, I, I don't know if I would say escape, but they're, they're just, uh, we don't necessarily even have words um, to describe it. Well, we're, we're sort of always like flailing between, um, is this the shruggy? Is this the, like, what is the thing that we're, we're talking about right now? Um, and I think that that's, you know, the, I think that there's a lot of work that's been done on um, here's a strong emotional state, right? Here's anger, here's, you know, uh, love, you know, everything on, on, on all our options on Facebook are all these like, you know, I should give everything a big hug, a, a big love heart uh, sign, right? Um, then really, I'm like, not really sure, you know, if I like, you know, how I'm responding to this news. Um, and so trying to map out that terrain of feelings is, 
interesting and, and maybe a little bit harder to uh, to quantify to to maybe it does slip through the cracks and thinking about the ways that people used to use memes and, and still do use memes in China to, to get around censorship right so maybe there's a way in which these like ambivalent emotions um, you know slip through the, the nets of emotional dragnets uh, that uh, yeah, that are designed to capture like kind of a very limited and, and kind of um, uh, caricature of, of you know what emotional states uh, you know uh, should be. Beautiful. I love that idea of, of slipping through the emotional dragnets, and in some ways, it makes me think of that scene from the film *The Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind*, where you know, if you want to hide a memory, you have to sort of take it off the cognitive map. You know, what is it to be off the cognitive map of digital networks? You know, what are those spaces? And I feel that your book, in so many ways, sort of outlines the the, the places that are off the map. You know, that that don't fit within the kinds of extractive economies that match up with. Adver you know, advertising parameters or even the sorts of things that platforms tell us are the right feelings to have and in relation to a piece of news, be it good or bad, as it we give it a heart, you know, it's, there's one has one feeling that we have that's most of the time completely inappropriate to what we're actually reacting to. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I also think that, I mean, this is a maybe too personal of a, of a story, but I mean, I, I feel like, um, there's, you know, as an Asian American, you know, there's always a problem with readability for me, right? Like people are not quite sure, you know, is he inscrutable? Is he? And so I feel like I, almost like I'm in a silent movie myself, uh, you know, certainly when I write emails, I have to put a lot of exclamation marks, right? To be like, I have a lot of personality too. I, I'm, I'm really excited about what you, so, I mean, to, to try to explore, you know, these these kind of more reticent emotional states is also to try to understand something about how race operates, right? Um, and how, um, uh, you know, the, the kinds of, uh, I mean, all, all these states that um, are, are sort of mapped into values that are, are devalued, uh, that uh, we, we don't tend to um, see anything worthwhile. Uh, uh, as Kathy Park Hong writes in her book, Minor Feelings, I mean, our, our, you know, one's feelings about being a racialized subject is is complicated. Like, it doesn't, you're, you can't say, like, what, you know what it's a minor feeling you, you can't say that it's it's always about being angry because you can't say that you're you can't let on that you're angry right so so what are what are, what sort of happens when you uh, when these feelings kind of turn inward and become invalidated? I, I think this is another attempt to try to describe it through the word biology perfectly said and and it, it is something that i find particularly interesting in this book and particularly at this time in 2022 that you know so many of the public discussions around race and identity have been full of heightened emotion of feelings of rage of anger of really expressing intensity and yet in your book i think you you bring us something different you say how do these feelings intersect with experiences of of boredom of passivity tell us a little more about this this kind of this doubling of you know, sort of the, the response against that type of experience of just what it is to be yeah. you know, seen as the other particularly in america at this moment yeah i mean i think this is um the expectation uh, and i think this gets especially mapped under black bodies right as kevin quashie writes about so brilliantly um is that you know, if you're black, you're always seen as, you know, going, you know, on, a, you know, on a scale of 10 of 10, you know, you're always, you know, seen as, as trying to, um, you know, be political. And, you know, I, I teach creative writing and, and many of my students are, are tired of doing that all the time. They're tired of like, you know, performing the um, the role of being the other, um, primarily for consumption, right? Uh, for they're, they're tired of writing these kinds of narratives that, um, uh, where they always have to wear their identity on their sleeves and and only be that. Uh, and so, um, you know, the the sense that um, there are all these other ways of of, of being within, um, uh, uh, and also um, a real sense that uh, the you know these these terms such as inclusion and diversity are. Um, deeply problematic. Um, I think that you write about an atlas of AI, this, this moment where the IBM uh, data set, uh, when they try to become more diverse, they just like add more faces on. Um, and there's something really messed up about uh, saying like, okay, we're gonna solve the problem. We're gonna like maybe hire like one more person of color uh, and then check this is like gonna be the answer to all the problems about diversity. Um, it doesn't really address um, how race works. And 
I think how race works on the internet is, is complicated these days. It's not just, um, it's both the, the kind of visual um, representations of uh, people, but it's also the way in which um, uh, passivity becomes a matter of race, right? If you play mm -hmm. the game World of Warcraft, you know, if you're not interacting with other people, then people are like, okay, that's an Asian character that's just mining for gold rather than, um, you know, interacting and being lively. So I think I'm trying to understand, you know, all the different ways that race works, even when you don't have, you know, a visual um, body there that you can like, say the skin colors like that. So, um, yeah, that's, it's a, it's a it's a weird way in which, and it works through things like data sets. It works through algorithms. Uh, it works in all these layers that um, I've just begun to kind of unpack uh, in this book. I'd, I'd really love to to see how that progresses forward in your work going on from here, because it, it really makes me think of uh, Simone Brown and her work in Dark Matters. She uses this term digital epidermalization, like the way in which AI systems are ascribing race based yeah. on skin tone, the fact that this this you know, biological idea of race that has been rejected in every scientific discipline that we care to name, but remains embedded inside AI systems that, oh, you have this color skin and the Kirkpatrick mm -hmm. scale, that means you must be this, you know, racial orientation. And again, that that has been completely accepted by systems that are judging us and assessing us and ascribing identity to us every day. And that is where race has, has been implanted, really encoded into these systems. Um, and so I think that it is itself a passive experience because it's it's being determined that you are this race because you are this <laughs> color when you appear on this screen. I mean, how, how extraordinarily backward. Um, yeah. we've, we've sort of reached this point where we've undone a century of work that's really looked at the cultural experience and the manifestation and making of race. I'm thinking here of Stuart Hall and his you know, incredibly important work as if, as if none of that had ever happened. <laughs> and now machines <laughs> will tell us what race we're right. based on what we look like in a Zoom call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's something ridiculous about it. I mean, the this uh, the sense that like I I've just become this category, and I can discover my category, right? I mean, you can go to websites that like tell you what the advertisers believe your race to be, and you're like, oh, like, guess what? This is you know my my identity now. Um, and and the solution to that somehow being okay, if we just add more check boxes, you know, if we add you know a few more values to that, then um, somehow we'll solve the problem of of race. You know, yeah, there, there's something really um, it doesn't get at that logic of, of classification of, of turning us into uh, and and as you point out with Brown's work um, this very shallow idea that you know that, you know this this color value becomes uh, yeah your, your racial identity it's, it's absolutely ridiculous and then of course it it fractures into a sort of a Facebook universe where when Facebook was actually found to be allowing advertisers to direct their ads based on their racial categorizations and they were fined heavily for this, they then create a set of proxies so that instead of saying, you know, Asian American, they can say a fan of K-pop or, you know, <laughs> this is how I reach a Korean market. And, you know, this is this is somebody who's interested in rap. Like it's just these terrible, you know, cultural stereotypes that become proxies for race. And that that is now this kind of arm's length way of trying to get around the kinds of restrictions that we have specifically around racialized targeting. Um, it does take on, frankly, a, a quite you know, surreal and ridiculous aspect, the more you actually look at these things. But I know our time is short and I want to just um, use this extraordinary privilege to ask you one more question. Um, and I'm going to ask you to think back um, to a book that was published in 1947, also after a very significant time in human history. And Simone de Beauvoir um, wrote a book called The Ethics of Ambiguity. And she really was contending with this sort of ambiguous relationship that we have to our own freedom how you know, freedom itself can be an ambiguous state. And I want to know if there's also, for you, an ethics of lethargy. Mm. Yeah, um, that's such a great question. And I think that the ethics comes simply in what it means to also realize that we are acted upon um, and not just the ones that act all the time. Um, and what it means to... Uh, what it means to to realize that our uh, in ourselves or individuals um, are are created by the world outside of us by other people um, and not just you know because we're born with some sort of precious individual thing that um, uh, 
what does it mean then to undo some of that, that kind of strong sense of individualism, that strong sense of freedom, um, the sense of freedom as an individual that sort of fights back against the world that uh, says, fuck the norm. Um, uh, what does it mean to be a little bit more, um, a little bit less of an I and a little bit more of a, like, you know, an I slash we all the time? Um, and I think that's where an ethics might come from, um, an ethics that, uh, you know, realizes that we are always subjects and objects, that um, we are bodies and also um, that we are bodies with other people. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I wish I had a, um, a clear um, answer because it's a, it's a weighty one and I, I want to think about what um, in ethics of lethargy are. Um, but I think that um, there's, you know, really what I'm trying to move away from is trying to, um, you know, I, I feel like one of the ways that digital capitalism works is through this, all these forms of classification and sorting and, and uh, deciding, you know, um, you are a user, you, this is a server. Um, and Lethargy kind of says, you know, what if, what if you let go of, of some of that uh, and embrace the ambiguity with freedom, uh, embrace the ambiguity with uh, seeing, seeing agency is not just something that um, comes out of me telling other people what to do, but also um, the, the capacity, because I think lethargy is ultimately capacity, right? It's something that is possible um, uh, within, it doesn't have to always be actualized. And so maybe ultimately my last answer to your question is, um, what does it mean to not do all the time? Uh, what does it mean to try to have an ethics um, that, uh, Tries to understand who gets to do and, and what it means to to not to. Uh, so um, that's a great question, and I, I want to keep thinking about uh, the pouvoir. But uh, yeah, maybe that's my beginning of the answer. It's a wonderful answer, and and it's my opportunity to tell everyone again that you should buy this book, A Digital Lethargy. It also made me think in in hearing that answer that a, a wonderful companion volume to this might be Jenny O'Dell's How to Do Nothing. That sort of together <laughs> that idea of you know what is it to actually to take the agency to do nothing to reduce that sense of constant self-performance and to actually think about embedded community in different ways and 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 again it is a politics of refusal less a kind of active state of protest and perhaps more of a passive shrug and that is itself, you know, a, a reaction. So on that, um, on that note, I'm going to turn to Simone from Books and Books for questions um, from the audience. I see we have a couple. So Simone, if you wanted to join us, we would love to hear questions for Tong Hui. Um, hello again. First of all, thank you both so much for this discussion. It was really insightful. I really enjoyed it. Um, I actually had my own question. Uh, Hui, what was the research process for this book like? Was there a specific process that you followed or? Yeah, that's, um, I, I really wish that I had a good one um, because I think that, you know, if a documentary filmmaker were to ever watch, uh, you know, film me working, it would just be me typing at the computer screen. It would be really boring, right? Um, I think that for this one, uh, what's interesting about it is, uh, you know, I tried to travel in some ways the digital supply chain in very limited ways. I'm not a trained anthropologist. Um, but, um, you know, I, I tried to peek in a little bit and, and see what a micro worker's life is like um, by reading accounts, uh, by watching films. Um, you, know, you know, how do they actually feel about uh, this, this strange exploitative work that they're in? Uh, and what are their sort of hopes and, and dreams for it? Um, what is it like to, uh, you know, be an Amazon work, warehouse worker um, and to be sort of controlled by the clock, um, but also um, try to understand what that feeling of being a temporary worker is constantly. Um, and then what, uh, and then it's talking to artists, right? Talking to artists uh, who are often, I mean, one of them that I uh, spoke with uh, had spent uh, a summer uh, training AIs herself. Uh, and I think there was a kind of funny collapse between her work as a visual artist being, you know, like working with visual shapes and so on. And then like literally like mapping out shapes on the screen um, for the AI. Uh, but I think that you know, uh, talking to people and, and trying to understand um, the, uh, what, what they see us doing, um, 
so maybe I'll just end with an anecdote, which is that uh, you know one of the artists I closed the book with, uh, Nibia Pastrana Santiago, um, would hold performances of not doing uh, of doing nothing, um, primarily in Puerto Rico. Uh, but then you know she went on the road and, and did this a few times, um, and so in several times in her performances, I remember you know. Um, enduring the, the nothingness, enduring the the five hour performance along with her, um, trying to trying to document it, but also just trying to be you know, as much of a part of that performance as possible. So, um, trying to feel the weight of data pressed into me, you know, for a friend's piece um, on data entry. Uh, so, um, I think that ultimately the process for this book is is just trying to capture and describe. Um, you know what what it is like to live uh, and feel, and, and and I think that is something that requires like you know all these. Um, uh, I, I wish I could have traveled a little bit more. I, I had a I had a toddler, uh, I had a, a now toddler, I had a baby uh, in the middle of writing this book, so uh, that really put a cramp on my ability to fly around and um, do things. But uh, hopefully that answers your question a bit. It did. It did. Thank you. Um, just questions from the audience. I see some now. Um, Lucas asked, with our world going more and more digital, do you see a possibility of younger generations reversing the effects of social media on our culture? If possible, how would you see this cultural shift happening? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, you know, two of my students and I just spent the summer looking at TikTok videos um, and trying to understand, um, you know, what does lethargy look like there? Is it quiet quitting? Is it, um, you know, some other forms? I mean, I think that the younger generation is keenly aware of this this pressure to perform oneself um, and keenly aware of, of the problems of social media. But even as they see it as a way of of being seen, um, especially you know, um, you know, if you're, for example, uh, you're trans, you know, this might be a place where you're able, you're comfortable to be out. Um, if you have a disability, this might be a, uh, the, this might, you know, one one short post uh, on the internet might be, you know, your way of of, of gaining energy, you know, for for the day. Um, so I, I think that there's a kind of ambivalence there that. Um, is productive, right? It's it's not an all or nothing kind of um, uh, relationship to social media uh, because there is kind of no outside. And I think that lethargy is an attempt to kind of describe a world where um, you can't just turn it off. You can't just um, make it all go away. Uh, uh, but what is it like to try to act uh, from within this world, uh, to try to change it from within the system? Um, and I think that's why uh, it's especially interesting to sort of watch, um, yeah, uh, you know, uh, videos where, you know, um, nothing happens, but that gets, you know, connected by algorithm to other videos where nothing happens. Uh, just, you know, try to see if there's like, you know, something going on there. If there's like, you know, a kind of collective um, thing there. So uh, all I would say is that um, I'm increasingly aware of my own age. And so I, I'm increasingly like, don't want to say the young people uh, in any way, like I feel like I, I, that's a really bad position to be in. <laughs> like the young people are doing this, the old people are doing this. Um, but I'm excited to see. Uh, you know, I mean, even even as I wrote the book, TikTok kind of came out um, in the middle of it, and to see a place where personalization algorithms are the point of the app, right, rather than something that kind of works in the background and they're subtle. Um, uh, so it'll be exciting to kind of see what happens next. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, we have another question from Heather, and she asked, is digital lethargy individualizing or collective? Is it contagious? If it is a, ref if it is a refusal, refusal slash lack of interest and participation, is it antisocial or at least anti-intersubjective? How affecting and inter-animating is digital lethar lethargy? Sorry, guys. Yeah. Hi, Heather. Um, thanks for the question. Uh, I think it's collective, right? Because I think that it weakens this our attachment to ourselves as individuals. Um, I think it is a little bit contagious as well. I mean, I think about the yawn that kind of spreads in a room. Um, um, and I think that uh, rather than it being asocial, I think that there's a kind of sociality in it, right? It's just not a sociality that happens either in the kind of interactive sense of like, you know, you're you're like lively and you're you know, having this like animated conversation like Kate and I are having. Um, it doesn't always have to look like that to count um, as, uh, as, a, as a form of sociality. And so really uh, lethargy is also an attempt to think about new forms of collectivity. Like how are we with each other on the internet uh, in ways that are maybe a little bit less um, 
uh, you know, some original model of the internet is like, we all sort of like bear our authentic selves to each other. And like, I tell you all about like this, you know, all the things that I really want to talk to you about. And, and we'll have this like great coffee shop debate, you know, in public about um, big issues, you know, how can um, simply like sending an LOL to somebody else or how can simply sending a ping, um, because I think these are the forms of um, being next to other people that are, are in some sense like more common, right? Than this kind of fantasy of, of what the internet is. Um, you know, I think about this scene in Sleeping Beauty, the movie that I write about where um, a lot of the workers are just kind of hanging out with each other and they're sort of distracted and they're not, um, they're not having great conversations about like, okay, so wow, like, you know, um, I'm being exploited by an employer and like, you know, what we really should do is like, we should try, no, they're like saying like, hey, like, what's up? Like, how are you doing? Are you okay? You know, um, but these like smaller moments, these smaller moments of being together are really more interesting to me um, because they, they are, I think they add up to something different. Um, they add up to something which is, uh, if, to coin a phrase, an asocial form of sociality, a form of sociality that um, doesn't work by the normal rules. Um, uh, again, in that movie, there's a there's a scene where a woman who's asleep, um, the main character comes and uh, wipes a spot of drool off of their face. And there's something really powerful and beautiful about that gesture, even if it's a gesture that that woman will never realize happens to her, you know, because she's still asleep. Um, but um, Looking at all these kind of small ways that we can be next to each other uh, is, I think, um, the uh, what the lethargy can do. Uh, with that said, lethargy is not just like doing very little; um, it's also being hyperactive, right? Uh, this is the idea of acedia, uh, is that um, uh, you know, like doom scrolling and, and like you know, swiping furiously and, and, you know, I have like 20 tabs open. I mean, that's also digital lethargy. So digital lethargy is not just like, you know, small things too. It's also like being too much and uh, all at the same time. Uh, so yeah, uh, Heather, I hope that answers your question. Okay, well, that's all the questions that we have for tonight. Um, again, I want to thank both of you so much for, you know, coming on on behalf of Books and Books. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much for moderating, Kate. Thank you so much, Tom Hoy, for sharing your book with us. Um, yeah, I thank you to the audience for their participation. Thank you for joining. Um, wherever you are, I hope you have a great day. And please buy a copy of Digital Lethargy from Books and Books. And yeah, I will think I'll end the broadcast now. Thanks thank so much, so Simone. And thank you, Tom Hoy. It was just such a delight to read your book and to meet you tonight. Thank you so much for both of you. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks. Hope to see you guys in the next, uh, next chat. So. Bye. Bye, everyone.